All right, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between, welcome once again to the Sin Shop live stream. I am, of course, the Mighty Pong, and with me tonight is the world famous Jed, and he's our victim for tonight. Uh, he is, uh, well, well, we'll introduce him here in, in, in just a quick second. In fact, no announcements. Oh, there is one announcement, one announcement, and one announcement only. Coming up in three weeks, there will be a live robot fighting event courtesy of VCR, and we will be streaming it live for you from Millennium Fandom here in Las Vegas. Let's get this party started here. Okay, uh, this is all, of course, on behalf of the Sin Shop. You can go to sinshop.org for more information on the shop. Information is down there below, wherever it, it's down, down that way. There you go, it's down there. Jed, tell us a little bit about Jed. You were the CTO of Praxis Aerospace. What uh, did a CTO do at Praxis? Basically, anytime anybody saw something that they thought was mildly technical, they came to me and asked me to actually do the work. <laughs> got it, got it, okay. Um, and depending on the project, either I would find somebody to do the work or have to do the work myself. So you were cashing the checks that the salespeople were writing? Essentially, yeah, for for various technical pieces. Right. Um, you know, my brother, you spent a lot of time with him. He was in charge of all the business aspects and and the um, you know the legal stuff and the FFA, FAA uh, details. And then I dealt with you know, is it actually possible to put you know however many uh, batteries on a on a quadcopter or whatever, or what kind of wiring is needed for that, or yeah. you know, all kinds of different things. What were some of the more more uh, uh, crazy challenges that you had to solve? Well, the interesting, I mean, the stuff that we usually ended up having to tackle were not super crazy or exciting things, but more mundane stuff, like when you're flying a drone in the desert and it's already 120 degrees out, yeah. and the thing, you know, the electronics on it start getting unstable at like 130, what do you do? Um, in some cases, that means using ice packs and coolers. Wow. Like just in, yeah, you just chill all the components before each flight mm -hmm. and keep it cold enough so that by the end of the flight, it uh, hasn't hit peak yet. Um, in some cases, it, uh, you know, the more interesting design challenges meant like re-architecting so that speed controllers could get some airflow over them or adding heat sinks. Um, you know, I had some point a bunch of like copper testing, like where I was building custom heat sinks to attach onto speed controllers wow. um, for some of the VTOL uh, airplanes we did. So hmm. yeah, heat, heat and heat dissipation is a big one. And then of course the battery, um, you know, maximizing energy availability while keeping weight down so you could have most longest flight time is uh, the other key. So just a lot of it is just like mundane, boring things like specking out the thinnest possible wire you can get away with at, you know, maximum current uh, like when you're taking off or whatever. Why the thin is just, just for weight? For weight, yeah. Because you don't like nothing like if you use too big a gauge wire, you just have a lot of extra weight. And even though you could carry a lot of power, it doesn't buy you anything. Right. Right. But if you go too small, those, uh, those motors can pull, can pull a lot of juice. I can, I can definitely see why heat would be a, a situation. Were there ever times where it had to be like hardened or where it had to be like, uh, you know, like the motors were going to take a lot of impact, stuff like that. Not really necessarily talking about combat robotics, but, yeah, no, I never really had to deal with um, with those specific challenges. We had, you know, brainstormed and talked about that stuff from time to time. But um, the closest I could really say is either hardening from outside electromagnetic interference, mm. or um, or even modifying an airframe to get better, um, you know, better EM characteristics. So um, better what character? If you're building. Uh, electromagnetic e EM. EM, yeah, got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you're using, for example, carbon fiber, carbon fiber is very conductive, so it acts as a great shield for your radio stuff. So even though it's a great, you know, body um, for your aircraft, unless you have the right place, your antennas external, or a lot of um, a lot of drones just expect you to like throw your antenna pieces inside the body somewhere. And um, 
yeah, so dealing with those so that antennas are facing the right way and also for longer range stuff, higher power, longer range. Those are some of the other challenges there. Hmm. I watched a video this afternoon with a guy uh, who who was uh, he's the the captain of the Bite Force team. Uh, they've won BattleBots like three years, uh, three three different years, and um, he was talking about hardening uh, the motors. But he would he would take them apart, and where the permanent magnets uh, were mounted in the 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 shell that goes over the whole thing, you know, that goes over the cylinder, the magnets inside mm-hmm. of that, the permanent ones. He would actually epoxy and fill it, the epoxy that he put in around that whole thing to to keep you know shock from hitting it and knocking the magnets loose and, and killing that motor. That's- yeah, yeah, I could see how that would be a big problem in you know drones, the drone stuff and the aircraft stuff. We had done, um, you know, that sort of thing. You would you would immediately just replace the whole engine. <laughs> yeah, if there's any any sort of impact or question of uh you know question about its reliability because the faa is pretty serious about that sort of thing oh yeah they are yeah is that kind of the main thing that goes into like uh the frame materials and and you know engine types stuff like that or no i mean it depends it entirely depends on what you're building and what you're working on yeah um you know carbon fiber is a great lightweight um you know uh, building material and it's a lot stronger than just fiberglass, but essentially it's the same techniques and same, you know, building methods as using, uh, using fiberglass in many cases. Hmm. So, um, it's, it's very common for aircraft because it's so light and so strong. Uh, it does take, it takes a, you know, uh, one of the things I've learned while I was CTO of Praxis was that um you know engineering something so that it works is really easy but it's uh it's not until you get to these tight specs where you want to have it like so that it works but it's also as weak and as cheap and as inexpensive as possible yeah (laughs) so it it works just barely enough but not too much yeah um and airplanes are a lot you know there's a lot of that in there because you want to you know you apply you're you're like when you're building a fuselage or something you apply all your epoxy and and material and then you scrape off as much as possible so that you get it down as light as as lightweight yeah and that's like every engineering challenge i had to deal with uh, with the drone stuff was similar to that where it was like trying to optimize past um just the hobbyist uh throwing it together design like designing something so that it fails you know, so that it won't fail before the warranty expires, but, you know, isn't <laughs> so strong that yeah. it will live forever. Yeah. You know, that takes some talent, I think. Yeah. And that's one of the things I realized. I much prefer being a hobbyist. I'd way rather just slap it together and show the prototype. Right. Yeah. No, that that's my big problem, too, is I'll, I'll do that, yeah. too. Yeah. Those were the most fun projects where we had, like, prototyping can, you know, is it possible to do something? Yeah. Can we take a fixed wing and like just turn it into a quadcopter, you know, VTOL with some minor changes or. Oh, wow. Um, Did you? That sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That actually turned out to be a pretty common approach for getting short takeoff or zero, um, you know, zero one way takeoffs hmm. or fixed wings. Like everybody just said, strap a quadcopter frame on it. When when it's out of quadcopter mode, do the what do the propellers rotate and provide forward thrust? It depends on the design. So yeah. a couple of manufacturers um, really cheaped out, and they they built um, aircraft, fixed wing aircraft with like no rudders, and they would use the quad rotors at, to steer oh. after takeoff. Hmm. Um, uh, or there are ones where. Um, yeah, we, we had worked briefly on a design that had tilting uh, rotors so we could use them not just for VTOL, but then tilt forward and, and transition to forward flight. Right. Um, and then if I remember correctly, there's one that had like a some software to try to lock the rotors so that they would be in the right position so they would, wouldn't impact flight, but would still just sit there. Oh, interesting. As, a, as opposed to be free spinning. Yeah. Yeah, I was talking to somebody about about this 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 thing I'm about to start doing, 
Uh, and it's like, you know, I feel like at any moment, if someone's going to tap me in, on the shoulder and say, um, um, Mr. Mr. Pong, I'm afraid we're going to have to ask you to leave. We found out you're actually three children sitting on each other's shoulders in a trench coat. Uh, you are not exactly. actually an adult and you shouldn't be here. Oh, yeah. I feel that way all the time. I mean, yeah. Same sort of thing. It's like, you know, oh, crap. Any minute somebody's going to discover that, that the only way I can do my job is by constantly Googling everything everybody asks me. <sighs> Yeah, but I think I think people I think people underestimate the value of that though. Like oh, for if, sure. I mean, yeah. that's how we're still employed, right? Is is people forget how important it is to um, be able to gather a lot of disparate information and then distill it down into something useful and weed out the bad stuff and you know recognize the good stuff or know when to question. Hmm, is that right? Or you know, oh, that looks totally good and legit definitely something a skill i think that people don't recognize yeah because it, it seems as though that whole thing the whole uh learning how to learn is not a thing that's taught i think it's one of the things that the the what was it common core stuff was meant to address oh really but um yeah uh or at least expose kids people to different ways more different ways of doing things instead of saying there's one right way to do to solve a problem like interesting to multiply four times five well so i'm i'm actually interested in chasing that with you actually because it's funny that's the first defense period that i've heard about common core that that the whole point is to teach you to do things in a slightly different way you essentially like to right. learn how to or, learn go ahead yeah or even just to know that there are different ways to do it yeah. and that one way isn't necessarily better or worse for you or me. Like the best way for you to multiply four times five is whatever way that works for you. Right. If that means memorization. If that means thinking of five fours, thinking of four fives, thinking of, you know, mm -hmm. five times two twice, like doesn't matter. If the best one is the one that you like and that works for your brain and everybody's different. A lot of the common core stuff I, I had looked at when I looked at it, I thought, it seemed pretty reasonable if you look at it from that approach. If you look at it from the how to learn and how to expose people to more ways so they have better building blocks. I think it'll be a really interesting long-term experiment. Like I look forward in 10 years to seeing the test results. Yeah, yeah. Because I think what, I, I, I think what happened is, 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 is at some point in the, you know, I guess in the, in, when I was a kid, I guess we were still thinking that, oh, we're just going to have manufacturing jobs forever. So you don't need to think critically. You need to, you need to go and, and operate that machine and do what I tell you, you know? Right. Uh, and or, not ask questions and not, not you, know, you, you exactly. need to be, yeah, you need to be comfortable with sitting in one spot and doing some rote work for eight hours a day. Yeah. For some jobs, like that's the problem is identifying where that needs to be modified in the future i did uh so one of the things i've done in the past is a technical trainer mm -hmm. course designer spent a lot of years doing that so i spent a ton of time like trying to figure out how do people learn best especially for technical topics yeah um, so it's, i always find it interesting to talk about gave us a follow we thank you so much miss lily k come on back and uh and and see us uh right here every uh every friday night for uh for the main show and on uh, Monday nights, we've got our project stream where we work on projects and occasionally even finish them, kind of. I mostly finished my 909 kick last week. I was, I've been threatening to finish that thing for a while. Do you do that a lot? Do you, do you have a lot of unfinished projects? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because the moment I can visualize the end of the project, um, I'm bored with it and no longer interested. Yeah, that is. And yeah, yeah that's it. Like, because in your head, it's done. You can visualize the end. It may as well be done because so what? There's just these little final pieces you have to stick together mm -hmm. or, you know, but because you can picture it, it's done. Anything yeah. you can visualize is complete, is complete and then boring. Um, yeah. Your, your brain has already given you the good chemicals. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's the curse of, uh, of being able to see, you know, to vi the vision of, uh, of assembly or whatever. I don't know what the right term is. But. Mm. Yeah, that's actually... <laughs> yeah, one so of, I have lots and lots of half-finished projects. Yeah. 
one of the uh, one of the trailer the trailer for our our Twitch channel when you when you come onto our Twitch page has me talking about the trap of early announcements, and that's what that is. Like, if you announce a thing is going to happen, like like I don't like to announce things before they happen. I, exactly. Because then, like you say, I'll be like, oh well, we already did it. It's fine. The only reason I'm, yeah. I'm saying anything at all about the the uh, robot fights is because I want people to go to them. <laughs> so I, I should probably let people know that uh, this this show is uh, actually, speaking of sponsors, they're not a sponsor, but anyway. Uh, but this show is being done on behalf of the Sin Shop. Uh, we're a maker hacker space that's located in Las Vegas, Nevada with the tools and material uh, that you can use to make pretty much whatever you can think of. Now, we're currently uh, under renovation right now, but if you happen to be in the Vegas area and you'd like to either uh, help us uh, get the shop back in action or you'd just like to come and check out the shop, you can join us at sinshop.org forward slash discord uh, and join our discord and check out the shop build out channel to find out uh, what the current status is uh, and also uh, when the shop will be open. Uh, or you can just go to plain old sinshop.org for more information on the shop or meetup.com uh, forward slash sin shop to find out more information about upcoming events, including virtual ones just like this one.